Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, thank you all for coming. I'm Mrs. Lebrun, or Madame Lebrun. I teach French and also biology uh, here at Grant. So my mom is here today uh, to talk about her experiences as a, a World War II D-Day survivor. Uh, we will have time for questions at the end, um, so I can maybe come around with the microphone and uh, if you have something you want to ask, uh, you know, we'll go from there. Okay? Oui, bienvenue, maman. Ah, bien, merci. <laughs> It's going to be very hard for me to speak English, so uh, be patient. If you don't understand, you will have to ask Madame Lebrun later what I meant. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. How was survived World War II or D-Day? I hope somebody or everybody knows what D-Day was or uh, World War II that day. Do you understand the uh, history of uh, France and America? Yeah, you took history, all of you, I'm sure. Alors, bonjour. My name is Georgette Nadeau, but people call me Gigi. I was born in Normandy, France, before World War II in 1937. Therefore, I was almost seven years old on the 6th of June 1944, or D-Day. My parents had a small farm near Armanche, about a mile and a half from the beach called, called Gold Beach. The front door was directly by the roadside. This main road was called the Route de Bayeux, there was a large garden with fruit trees and many vegetables being grown. It was surrounded by edges where we often played hide and seek. I loved to climb the pear tree and eat the fresh pears. And here's uh, this is some pictures of, I'll just kind of throw in there that uh, there's pictures of their property, so on the bottom right, uh, so the house is gone, the farm is gone, but the property is still there. Um, so those are some more recent pictures. The one on the top right, she was trying to show, I think, where the ditch was, right? Which she's going to talk about, uh, that's where they hid uh, during D-Day. We had several fields for our animals. We had five cows, all with names. But the one I remember the most was Jolie Coeur. We also had a pig named Sophie, a horse named Fauvet, and many chickens and several geese. My mother worked at another farm to milk the cow using a little trillet tabouret, or it's a stool, an aluminum, and an aluminum bucket. We would transfer the bucket to the bidon, which was a big 25-liter uh, container, and carry it off. Here is a picture of my mom sitting on her little stool milking a cow. We call that in French, très vaches. That's the photo on the left. That's what my grandmother would do, milk the cows. Je peux continuer? Oui. During the occupation, the German came to have laundry done and get food from a house. An officer and a soldier in particular came regularly to get their laundry done. They would also requisition chicken, eggs, and milk. Not far, there was a castle that was being used as a command post by German officers. This is a picture of it. And explain maybe the photo on the right. You were saying after the war, you were able to go back to the no. castle? No. Yeah, you used to have a picture way after ah, the war. Ah, oui, au château, tu veux yeah. Yeah, oui. What was the reason why? You of said you, know, you knew someone that lived there or next door or something. The people that My aunt there. and uh, uh, uncle were working in the chateau. So her aunt and uncle worked at this chateau, so she was able to go back and visit. Okay. This is a photo of the castle now called the Chateau de Noé. One of the officers liked me a lot and said that he wanted to take me back to Germany. My mom said, no, I don't sell my children. 
My brothers also taught me to bake for bread or brought in German and potato or cartofil in German. From the German in the bunkers, the German were nice to us and gave us the food. Maybe we reminded them of their own children back home. I remember to go to school at La Rosière during the occupation. It was an old one-room school house. All the grades were in the same classroom. So real quick, um, this picture here is near where she lived. In, uh, so she's from Tassi Siomel, which is near Avalanche, which is where there was an artificial port uh, that was built uh, during D-Day. And so this is at Long Siomel. Uh, where they had all these German bunkers, uh, and they still have them there. And that's where my mom used to beg for food. Her brothers brought her with because she was small and cute. She was about six or seven at the time, and so they taught her how to beg for bread and, and uh, potatoes, right? Is that right? You said bread and potatoes. Uh, and they, yeah, they would uh, give them, you know, those things, and uh, that way it would help the family, you know, during those different times of the occupation. Okay. So I remember I walked from the school with my twin sister, I had a twin, Yvette. My younger brother and sisters were still too young to go to school and my older brothers started working as soon as they graduated from the eighth grade. On the 6th June 1944, my parents woke us up in the middle of the night as they heard airplane guns and loud noise. They said, put your clothes on children and follow us. The house seems to be not safe. I remember my mother said, I think it is the debarkment today or the landing of the Allied forces as a German officer told my mother a few weeks before, when we were running outside, millions of metallic ribbon fell from the sky, and I was told they were used to blow radars. Also falling from the sky were little cars flying around toward the civilians, toward the civilians, toward the civilians to take shelter. I remember I wanted to play with the ribbon and cards, but of course it was not the time for playing. So this is an interesting little bit of history. Um, my mom always said, you know, she saw this foil falling from the sky, and a lot of people are like, what is she talking about? Um, but it was, a, it was actually invented by a woman, um, and it was a woman in England that invented this and realized that if you threw this foil out from the airplanes, it would confuse the radar, so when the Germans were looking on the radar, it looked like there were millions of planes all over the place, you know, and it was kind of to confuse where actually the planes were and how many there were. Uh, so it was an interesting little strategy, a very simple strategy, really, and that's what was falling. And then they had these little cards warning civilians to take shelter, and that was used quite a bit, too. Also a little known fact, I think, that those cards, you know, fell from the sky uh, as well. Can I add something to them? Yeah. Uh, in the St. Lowe area, also the Americans dropped leaflets and pamphlets warning the civilians to get out of town fast because they too were going to be bombed in their turn as the war progressed. And the Germans weren't always quite so nice in giving people uh, potatoes and things there. They set up roadblocks so that nobody, the civilians couldn't leave town because they were trying to paint the picture that we were the terrorists and we were the bad guys so that if anybody lost their lives, they were stuck in town and couldn't escape the bombardment. So it wasn't always, um, uh, it didn't always work. <laughs> you know, if you're gonna drop pamphlets, uh, you hope that the civilians could actually get to read them. Right. We escaped into our garden shed made out of wood. Soon my parents realized it was not safe. Too many explosions near us. And uh, sharp metal pierced the wood walls. My mother decided to go further 
and we were ordered to run very fast a yard further into a deep ditch. So um, in Normandy, the fields were surrounded at that time by deep ditches. We, so we walked in a ditch and we stayed there scared and cold all night in the ditch. Very early the next morning, morning, my two older brothers were sent to get milk and clothes from the house a few yards away. Just after they left, a German soldier suddenly came out of nowhere and pointed his rifle to my mother, who was standing just outside the ditch. She shouted, don't shoot, we are civilians. I was very afraid because the soldier had a wild look in his eyes. He seems to have gotten separated from his unit. Luckily, he disappeared quickly into the darkness of the early morning hours. When my two brothers came back from the house, they were screaming, Mama, Mama, the house is gone. There is a big hole instead, and it's still smoking, full of debris. We think a bomb destroyed the house. Our family believe it was an American bomb that was trying to hit the, nearly, the nearby Chateau de Noé that was known to be the headquarters for the German army. My parents ran to the farm with all of us and discovered the disaster. I found the I found a cannon shell which my mom kept and I have it with me today, taken from the house. I remember seeing that just the stair in the attic of the house were left standing right there. Just that was standing from the house. That was left from the hall. I played in the stairs and thought it was a funny game. But of course, it was dangerous because it led to nowhere. We looked for our pig, our little Sophie, who was attached to a tree with a large chain. The chain was broken. We did find her later in a nearby field, as well all our cows and our beloved horse for vet. Because our house was destroyed, we had no choice, no choice but to return to the dish for three more days. We had nothing to eat, no clothes, and no shelter. We still could hear tanks and trucks on the road nearby, as well as anti-aircraft cannons and guns. The road where our farm was was the main road from Aramanche to Bayeux, so it was heavily used. A few days later, my mother went to the nearby castle to ask for help from the Red Cross. We were placed at a farm nearby with a large house and a courtyard and stayed in a room upstairs normally used for day laborers. Near this farm, many fields were transformed into camps for British and Canadian soldiers who continued to come through the area. Us kids would go and beg for chocolate and candies. The soldiers were always pleased to see us children. The nicest ones were the Canadians. I still have scars from crawling under the barber wire to get uh, those goodies and into the camp. Yeah, no, it's up there, yeah. So that's just, it's obviously more modern day photo. We, we couldn't find exactly what we were even looking for, but she did say the barbed wire was curled like that, right? When, when you were trying to get to the camp. 
Around this time, my two brothers, older brothers, decided to go to the beach at Aromanche. Although it was forbidden, I remember I could not believe what I was seeing. Thousands of soldiers, tanks and trucks everywhere. I recall picking up many little bottles for me to use as toys. They were empty penicillin bottles with green cap used to care for wounded soldiers. We stayed several months in a farm near next door and then hitchhiked on several British army trucks to my aunt's house. Because remember, we had no place to go. I remember that I had a little toy soldier that I found near the debris of our house. When the British soldier took me down from the last truck we were on to get to my aunt's house, the toy soldier escaped from my hand. It was dark outside, and I lost it forever. I cried and I cried. I was very, very sad. It was the only treasure I had from my childhood home. When we walked to my aunt's place, we crossed some railroad trucks, and I suddenly realized that it was near winter. It was very cold with snow on the ground, and I hate the cold. I noticed the big moon shining, and was holding my twin sister's hand. My aunt Anna and uncle Ernest live near the American camp. We loved it. I will collect it and beg for more candies and chocolate. On the road, many American soldiers on trucks would stop and give us goodies. This was one of my best memories of the war for me. So we looked it up on a map. So her aunt lived on another main road that was leading from where all the Americans landed at Omaha Beach. You've probably heard of Omaha Beach. And they were taking this other road that was also leading to Bayeux, which was a, a major city. So there was a road coming from Avalanche to Bayeux, but there was also a road from Omaha Beach that would lead to Bayeux. So that's where she ended up meeting the American soldiers. And yeah, a really great souvenir, actually, of getting all the chocolates and candies from them. When we walked to my aunt's place, we crossed some railroad tracks Oh. And I suddenly realized that it was near in the winter. No, you said that part already. I did? Yeah. Well, what is the question that you asked me? My mother was arrested. Yeah. During that time, my mother was arrested by two French police officers. She was wearing a dark green suit and was taken away. I watched this from the upstairs window and was uh, really shocked that what I saw. My father had accused my mother of, take, of being a Nazi sympathizer. Is that uh, yeah. He did this to revenge against her for living with the five smaller children without telling him. She was in prison at Caen for several months. Her sister came from Paris to charm the judge into being let go, and to let him her go. In April 1945, the five of us younger children and my mother left for Paris by train. Me and my sister went to the Catholic boarding school near Paris after the war ended. Well, my brother Jean went to a boys' boarding school in Lyon. We stayed at the boarding school until we were 14 years old. It was not always easy there. I remember being cold a lot and trying to hide from going to church in the very early morning. I was constantly getting into trouble and being punished. One time, on the day of my first communion, I ripped my veil, running through the door, and it snagged on the iron bed. My, my punishment was to be put in a potato sack and tied to a tree in a courtyard.
for all the other girls to point and laugh at me. I will never forget this incident. After boarding school, I went to a high school in Paris and the place where we lived at the courtyard where the famous Edith Piaf, a French singer, came to sing. We would throw coins from the window so that we could keep hearing her wonderful voice. Something, something else important I wanted to mention is that years after the war, my mother won a special medal called La Médaille de la Famille Française. It honors mothers of large family who raise their children with dignity and good education. Here is a picture of the type of medal that my mom received that oh, day. Yeah, so the, that medal, she got the silver one because it depended on how many children you had. So because she had seven, if you had six or seven children that you raised to adulthood after the war uh, with dignity and good education, as you said, uh, so she received that. I don't know what year, was that in the 80s she got it? Or? Do you remember when she got that award? What year? I think it was the 80s. Yeah, yeah it was many years later. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening to my story. I hope you found it interesting. My hope for you is that you continue to stay strong to the difficult time. Keep trying and work hard to better yourself and be successful in life. Thank you again. So if you have questions, maybe I can come around and if there's something you're wondering or want to hear more about, uh, you can let us know. Okay. Do you believe French culture changed after the war or during? Do you believe French culture changed uh, before or after the war? Yeah, or during it, it changed a lot. I don't know which way exactly or how to describe it, but it is not the same, no. Yeah, probably having the Germans occupying the country uh, had a big impact on the people, you know, emotionally and, well, obviously also financially and all that. So it left, it left a mark, it left a scar. But what's nice is in Normandy, they do still honor, I mean, they have, you know, all, every year, and me and my dad can talk more about it, every town has a celebration of, of the day when they got liberated by the Allies, whether it was the Americans, the Canadians, the British. Uh, they always honor that every year. And the school kids usually get involved and they, they kind of revisit that history. So they really did appreciate, especially in Normandy, what the Allies did for them. Right, Normandy is a little bit different uh, than the Paris area or some of the other metropolitan areas. Um, the, when they have their ceremonies, it could be uh, three weeks later or into July and August, depending on when some of the buildings were destroyed or people were killed and whatever they were commemorating. Sometimes they commemorate even the firing squad victims where the Germans would take the civilians who were part of the resistance, take them up on a hill at midnight, force the mayor of the town to be physically present to write down their names, and they'd shoot them all against the wall. See? And uh, when they would see me walking down the street, because I'm a member of the American Legion with the American flag, many of these same school children that you're talking about they run up and hug me and grab my legs and they grab the American flag and they want to hug it. Uh, some of the people say, well, we haven't seen uh, an American soldier, a real actual veteran, uh, walking down our street with a flag since the war. And they appreciate it and uh, they still love us very much. They'll never forget what we did for them. But it isn't that way all over France. Normandy is particularly very, very welcoming. Yeah, I would say that's true. Any other questions? Oh, actually, oh. Mom, I have a little bit more. Oh, that's my daughter, Leah, by the way. <laughs> sorry. It's my husband here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, Miss, Monsieur Nadeau. <laughs> I know it wasn't exactly your question, but the Germans, um, I took German for four years, 
they changed a lot. Their culture changed a whole lot, obviously, after the war. Um, specifically, I remember hearing it from my German teacher that the problem often was, well, you have East and obviously West Germans. They actually quite stayed that way. Like even after the war, after the Nazis left, after Hitler left, after all that happened, they still have a separation. They're, there are definitely a separation between East and West Germans, and they, the culture has changed immensely. But there are, there are certain little things that you can find in East Germany that are the same, but it's very minor. I mean, it's, it's very, very minor. Okay, we have another question over here. Uh, what was the reaction to when the Germans broke through the Ardennes and uh, France collapsed after that. What was your family's reaction to that? So I think he's asking when the Germans uh, started occupying France, when they started coming to your farm, you know, and, and it was kind of taken over by the Germans. What was your family's reaction? Uh, the reaction was we were told to be nice to the German. Okay, so my mother was supposed to help them as much as possible or feed them if they needed some food. So the government forced us to like Germany, but they were nice actually, so. They seem to be nice to the kids at least, yeah. so that was her experience, you know, as a young girl. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, one wanted to take Did it I back. answer your question? <laughs> yeah, okay. But, but you also have to understand that uh, radio contact was very limited for them during the war years. It was against the rules to have radio, so they didn't get all of the news that they would have wanted to hear. So they might not have even been aware of some of the battles that occurred. Yeah, but I was only seven years old, remember? <laughs> okay. How did you both meet, and how did you um, come to America, and what was that timeline? Oh. How did you meet, and how it, did you get here? It was a blind date. <laughs> Actually, I didn't like him at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I was with the NATO liquidation uh, forces operating out of the embassy in Paris, and I was the last American soldier to leave French soil after de Gaulle uh, gave the uh, heave-ho to the British and the Canadians and the Americans, and they moved the headquarters of NATO up to Belgium. So by some clever maneuvering, I got to uh, stay till the very, very end and actually turned out to be the last American there. And my final duty was General de Gaulle had given Eisenhower a chateau as a gift. The Americans do not accept gifts from anybody for helping them out during the war. Just a cemetery to bury their dead soldiers. So this, uh, this was kind of an honor to be, uh, before turning it over to the French, the, the chateau. Oh, well, and then the, the colonel suggested uh, that I have a date with this young lady here. Wasn't there a dance or something? Yeah, there was some kind of officer's evening. ball or something. Yeah, and, uh, and the young officers, according to the code of conduct of military uh, practices and traditions, the young soldiers were supposed to be accompanied by a very, very nice lady. So, uh, well, I couldn't really, since it was a, a s strong suggestion from the colonel, I guess I was kind of forced to have a date with her. And then I, we ended up being friends because she's a twin and I'm a twin. So we yeah. got to know each other. Yeah, so my dad is an identical twin and my mom is a fraternal twin and they both come from families of seven children, which is also interesting. Uh, but my mom also worked for NATO, so that's why how they met. So they both were working for NATO at the time and my dad was stationed in Paris um, during the 1960s, right? It was like the late 60s. Yeah, the, yeah, the Vietnam era. Yeah. yeah, explain what NATO is. Oh, the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Alliance. Uh, well, most of the uh, the countries in the northern part of Europe you know, are part of this. Uh, um, yeah, like a pact or yeah, agreement treaty. of all these countries. And it's meant uh, it was an anti-Russian type, really, influence of anti-communism to be a force in Europe uh, against uh, communism. Really. That's how it kind of started. Okay, other questions? 
Okay, hold on. Yes? I... The train was in Paris. About night getting Valley and Roses from Wally. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, any other questions? I don't understand the question. I think it was a question. It was more of a statement, I think. Um, actually, maybe you can... Uh, I'm trying to think of what are some other things you could... I don't know if you want... Oh, we got another question actually over here. Another culture question. Um, were any other surrounding countries, like did your cultures kind of merge with them, with other soldiers like uh, Britain and Sweden and all those other countries? Yeah, there is a very unusual curiosity. One of her sort of an adopted uncle suggested to me after many years of coming to D-Day events in Normandy, with my uniform and carrying the flag and so on. He said, well, have you ever gone to the German cemetery to pay respects to the dead uh, soldiers uh, of German background who gave their lives for their country and they were draftees just like you were or anybody else was? I said, no, that they were our enemies, but I went anyway to try to see what I would find. And I started reading the names on the graves and about I would say 35 to 40 percent of the graves were Polish names. And I found that really, really striking. I found my own name on four graves. I said, how could that be? You know, and I know that, that Hitler invaded Poland, took over many parts of Poland to get his access to the North Sea for submarines, and then my Grandmother had told me that our part of the family that still stayed in Poland were sent to the concentration camps as well, and the young men were drafted into German uniforms to be right where she was along the Atlantic wall there to defend the, uh, France against the invading armies, whoever they would be. So you ended up cannon fodder, poor Polish young men of military age who were forced with bayonet at their back to defend the German lines uh, of defense. So yeah, so not you all the soldiers were probably German. Huge. They might have been Polish or other nationalities huge. forced to fight uh, for right. them. Right, the, and then the, then the Polish naturally wanted to fix bayonets and slice through the German lines to get revenge. So the Germans didn't like fighting against the Polish soldiers. And it was a big mixture, you know, you had Romanians, uh, you had all kinds of nationalities. But I think coming back to influences of other cultures, I do think, with, especially when the Americans came through, that had a big impact. And I think even to this day, French people really like American culture. They like American words. They like American music. They like American movies. So I do think ever since then, you know, there's been a big influence. And for British too, I would say, but American culture. In France, especially you watch like news or stations or radio, they like to throw in a lot of American terms. So I think it's been culturally a, a big change over the years. And so English is the second language in Europe. Yeah, she said English is the kind of the second main language in Europe. Yeah. Something else you wanted to add, Mama, that uh, you no, forgot? Sure. Right, they, they use the word like meetings. Well, that's obviously an English word, meetings. Planning. You hear planning used all the time. This isn't planning. And you're like, wait a minute, they're, they're, they're mixing up our French language here. And, uh, of course, you're kind of shocked by that, aren't you? She, she, right. To hear them using words like uh, planning and things. No, I think yeah, I always loved the English language and uh, I felt great when I learned English myself. It took me five years to learn English and still I still have an accent. So anyway. Yeah. It takes time to learn a language. English is a wonderful language, yeah. I think. Oh, but the French students here in the, in, uh, that are present should at least know that if I can learn French at the age of 62, uh, an orangutan can learn French probably. <laughs> and if, don't worry, stay with it, you'll learn French. It's not, it's not that hard, it really isn't. 
Yeah, and actually, you've been paid some compliments, I heard, uh, in France. They, they think you're from Belgium or something? Or? No, no they, they, they think I'm from uh, Scotland, like uh, Sean Connery. The, the, um, <laughs> yeah, they, they think I'm like James Bond or something. That, and I don't know, I can't understand that. But uh, I guess if you speak other foreign languages, when you speak French, then you throw in an influence of other foreign languages you've learned, like a little bit of German and Spanish and so on. So it mispronounces in a, a sort of a hodgepodge way. Okay, I'm trying to see the clock. I don't know how much time we have. All five minutes, All five minutes. okay. Uh, talk about your military career and also his father by the way because this is kind of an interesting side note his father went through d-day landed at which beach he went through omaha beach oh he too. did go through omaha but later it was like the second or third wave second or something or third week yeah general Patton was catching uh, was taking prisoners like crazy he he was the real danger against the germans and uh, adolf hitler he often said, well, wherever General Patton is, that's where the war is going to be. So my father, being in the military police, had to be in charge of the German prisoners, and they just couldn't keep up with the guy. Uh, he cut through his battlefields like crazy, taking uh, prisoners. But all the men of my family were there during World War II. All of the uncles were there. We lost one in the Battle of the Bulge, one uncle. Uh, my godfather probably was, sh well, there's no question, he was shelling and shooting against his own cousins uh, in the Normandy battlefields on both sides of the, our Polish members of the family were on both sides of the same battlefield. Uh, because of that strange thing that Hitler did with conscripting a Polish uh, young men. Uh, so, would you yeah. say you got involved in uh, becoming, uh, becoming an officer because of your family and your dad oh, being in the military. Yeah, I, I wanted to follow my father's footsteps in which I ended up doing. Actually, it was a practical joke, but when they give you, when you volunteer for service, I was in uniform altogether 10 years. Uh, then when they give, when you go on active duty, they give you what's called the dream sheet. I think they still do it here. And you can ask to be stationed at a military post near a relative or, or someone from your family or something. So Vietnam was going on and I got uh, a bunch of buddies together in the officer's quarters there and I said, well, let's fill out all of our forms to say when because we're all going to go to Vietnam and get shot up over to ribbons over there anyway. Where's the best place in the world to be stationed? Paris, France, right? Practical joke. Well, filled out number one choice, Paris, France, duty station. Number two, Fort Carson, Colorado. Let's go skiing, everybody. Okay, we all filled out our forms the same way, the Bahamas. And they, they all thought that they were going to tear our forms up and throw away in the garbage can and send us on anyway to Vietnam. Well, we all got, about three months later, we kept contact and we all ended up stationed in Paris because of the NATO liquidation. They, they moved, uh, they, uh, they increased the strength of the soldiers by 10%, and so they were sending a lot of soldiers to Paris, France, instead of Vietnam. So it turned out to be a funny practical joke that paid off, actually. Worked out in his favor. <laughs> okay, well again, thank you all for coming. Let's give her and my parents actually a hand.